Thank you for tuning in as we continue our study in the life of David. Uh, we'll be in chapter uh, 2 Samuel chapter 10 uh, as we're as continuing to study where David is uh, uh, creating his uh, kingdom. Uh, he's going through and securing the borders, securing the land, and bringing peace uh, to Israel as God is using him uh, mightily in his, in, for that purpose. Um, let's open in prayer before we start. Hey, Father, again, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your many blessings. I thank you for uh, your servant David, Lord, and uh, how you used him mightily, uh, how you've uh, uh, chastened him, corrected him, guided him, and led him, Lord. As uh, fathers, pray just help us to, to learn through the life of David, Father, how you can use us and direct us and chasten us and lead us and for your purposes and to mold us in the image of your son. And I pray. Amen. Um, 2 Samuel 10 verses 1 to 5 is what we'll be covering first, and I'm reading from the NASB. And it says, and, it ha and as it happened afterwards, the king of the Ammonites died, and Hanan, his son, became king in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, just as his father had showed kindness to me. So David sent some of his servants to console him concerning his father. When, But when David's servants came to the land of the Ammonites. The prince, princes of the Ammonites said to Hanan, their lord, do you think that David is honoring your father because he has sent counselors, consolers to you? Has not David um, sent his servants in in order to search the land and search the city to spy out to overthrow it? So Hanan took David's servants and shaved off half their beards and cut off their garments in the middle as far as their hips and sent them away. When it was told to David, uh, told David he had sent them uh, for his men, he, they were greatly humiliated. And the king said, "Stay in Jericho until your beards grow, and they return." Uh, the key part of uh, the verse is actually in the very beginning. And now uh, that links chapter nine and chapter ten together. Uh, we saw in chapter nine that. Uh, David had the desire to show kindness or loyal love to uh, Mephibosheth because, for the sake of, uh, of Jonathan. Uh, and we see here that, and now, he wants to show kindness or loyal, loyal love again to uh, the Ammonites and to Hanan, which is the son of uh, Nahash, who was king. Um, in the case of, uh, with, with Mephibosheth, you know, the... It was a, uh, he had offered him uh, the love. He had offered for the sake of Jonathan. He offered him a covenant they made to Jonathan to take care of uh, his family. Uh, and Mephibosheth was humble and gracious and received what was offered from the throne of grace. Even though he was coming to a throne of judgment, it ended up being a throne of grace. Um, now David sought to also show kindness or loyal, loyal love uh, to Nahash's son, uh, which is Hanan, after, after Nahash had died. Uh, the Ammonites, of course, they were actually the enemy of, the, of Israel. Uh, they were of the Lied, of uh, or descendants of Lot. Uh, they had caused a lot of trouble to Israel when they came out of Egypt, and uh, they had been an enemy, enemy of, uh, of Israel uh, all along. Um, but uh, somewhere in David's, I guess, outlaw years, when uh, he was being chased by Saul, uh, Nahash had been kind to David, and David wanted to return that kindness uh, to uh, Nahanan, which is uh, Nahash's son. Uh, there's basically two ways we can look at this passage. One way is uh, a lot of people look into David and see him as a type of Christ. Uh, and his actions and what he does is, is a type of Christ. So we can look at it that way for this in this passage, especially in this portion of the passage, uh, as him being a type of Christ. Because uh, in chapter 9 uh, with uh, Mephibosheth, we see the prominent person there was David. Uh, as we said before, when we covered chapter 9, that the name David, the name King, and the name King David uh, were repeated like 16, 17 times in just that one chapter. Um, 
we get to chapter 10 and we see where David is now sending ambassadors. He's sending servants out uh, to uh, to spread the word. Uh, in, in chapter 9, where David is prominent, uh, he's bringing grace to the elect, the house of Israel, which is uh, Mephibosheth. Uh, we see in chapter 10, the, uh, the ambassadors, they're bringing grace to a Gentile or non-elect nation. Uh, and uh, we see... Uh, in that way that you know christ has told us to be uh, uh to go into the world and spread the gospel you can see in mark 16 15 he said unto them go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation and or, you can look at this and say oh david is taking that same initiative to show kindness or, or gospel of, of good news to other nations uh he's not looking to bring wars basically david is probably to try and create a, a treaty or an alliance with the, the Ammonites. Um, like I said, but you see where David is commissioning uh, his servants to do his, biz his business of spreading the good news out, as, as just as uh, Christ has done it with us uh, in spreading the good news. Uh, he had reached out to Israel, the elect, and we are uh, going to spread to all nations uh it, like i said the gospel went to israel first and then to all nations as well um when the king sends his message out uh we can see that it's uh basically misunderstood uh if it's I guess it becomes rejected um you know they say all oh, it is he's not bringing he's not consoling you he's here spying on you uh he's here trying to overthrow you um uh, you know in much the same way that when we present the gospel to people they are uh apprehensive as to what is our motive what what are, why are you telling me this what are you doing uh you know the world is so much used to the fact that they don't trust a kindness that comes out because they're figuring you're trying to get something back uh, and that's what the Israelites were being accused of, that there, this kindness act is coming because they're trying to get something out of it. And, you know, so they were they reject it, become suspicious, and the world is, is going to be suspicious of the gospel message. The world's going to be suspicious of what, what we're presenting and what we're bringing. And we should be see that as uh, the standard of what will happen, typically happen, happen that the world is not all crazy about accepting christ as savior to admitting that they're they're wrong or that they're there's sin there's an issue uh just like israel was uh with the, the king here to uh giving him a message of you know why should we accept their message why should we accept what they're what they're giving out there uh but what what you want to see is the correlation is that we shouldn't be surprised when the message we bring is mocked, we shouldn't be surprised when it's, when, it, when we're brought shame or rejected, because we're not preaching the world. We're preaching something different, and and David was preaching something different. He was bringing a kindness to them. Um, but basically, I like to teach this as to as it pertains to David, as as it pertains to you know God's chosen, uh, you know, as it turns to His children. Um, you know, as we said uh, earlier, we started covering the uh, Second Samuel when David came into power. This is part of the succession uh, of, of his uh, kingdom, and part of it was uh, international relationships. Uh, David, um, you know, he was. Uh, we saw in chapter 8 where he brought mainly the surrounding nations to pay tribute to Israel because of his victories. Uh, they actually were being taxed by Israel to, to uh, you know, uh, he didn't destroy them, but to let them continue to, to take, to give them him money, give him taxes. Um, this also included the nation of Ammon, uh, the kingdom which is directly to the, the, to the east of the Jordan River. Um, if you recall back in 1 Samuel chapter 11, uh, when Saul first became king, the Ammonites uh, were the ones who attacked him. And that king that attacked him was Nahash. And uh, they did it at uh, Jibish Gibeah. 
uh, and that was the beginning of Saul's reign, and Saul actually had uh, defeated him there. Uh, but Nahash continued to reign. Uh, he was actually almost like 50 years from the time that uh, Saul had first come to the time that it is here. It's like uh, 10, 12 years into the reign of David. Uh, and now he has passed and his son is now taking, taken over, which is Haman. Uh, because of that unspecified or un, we don't know what the kindness was that Nahash had given to David. David was under a, a covenant or a responsibility or loyalty to offer kindness as well. Um, if, uh, you know, he wanted to express his sympathy to Hanan for his father's loss. Uh, Hanan's advisors, uh, they didn't see eye to eye with this idea that, the, you know, we have defeated, Saul defeated us, and now David's going to try to do that. Uh, you know, he David had taken, uh, had beaten him uh, to take up the land up to the Euphrates River, which is promised to Israel. Uh, David is going to uh, obtain that. Uh, and has success so far, but that's where he stopped. Uh, and now they're thinking, well, now that the king is dead, he's going to come in and take the rest. So they don't trust him. They don't. They don't want to see him. See him there. Uh, they convince the king that this is what David's method is. This is what David's doing. Uh, he is not bringing. Um, he's not bringing peace. He's trying to spy us out. <coughs> the king. Uh, accepts this message and has decided to uh, berate the, David's messengers. Uh, he cuts off half their beard. Uh, and of course, for the Israelites in their culture, uh, all the men wore full beards. That was a sign of their maturity and a sign of their authority. And for half that beard to be cut off um, was an insult to them. Uh, the ambassadors, uh, you know, they were uh, they were brought, suffered great indignity for it. Uh, their garments, they were cut uh, to, I guess, the, at least you can say is an immodest, in, an immodest length. Uh, basically, is cut to their hips in the front so that they were uh, openly ridiculed. They were uh, in, uh, ignig ignig uh, they were embarrassed greatly because of what was, you know, they were showing out of uh, in front of the people, and it's uh, great embarrassment that was and indignity that was done to uh, to them to the ambassadors. Um, you know, if you look at that, you say, "Well, why does God allow others to mistreat us or Israel in such a way?" You know, th this this is uh, this is cruel. Uh, what it's doing to uh, basically. Uh, humiliate them in almost every which way they could think of they humiliated them um, <coughs> uh, like I said I think David's uh, goal uh, was to create a treaty uh, with the Ammonites uh, to continue the peace that was uh, Israel was starting to to have um, you know uh, he was getting basically, friendly with those on the eastern flank to give him peace to give him rest uh he was attempting a treaty with an enemy enemy of the israel um in deuteronomy 23 verse 6 3 and 6 it says no ammonite or moabite shall enter into the assembly of the lord neither their descendants even unto the tenth generation uh shall enter into the assembly of the lord verse 6 it says and you shall never seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days david was basically being disobedient to a command that they, they were given when they were entering into the land you know uh disobeying the, the command and david's intentions were to create a pact to create a treaty to um to make things easier for himself as opposed to uh obeying what the lord what god's word is so you know, how does God allow or why does God allow the mistreating? Because God is faithful to his word. And he basically um, blew this plan up that David was having to by getting the Ammonite princes to 
have the king see that this is not what it is. Um, David's intentions were uh, were basically stopped. They were dismissed, uh, and God uh, basically is again separating his people unto himself. Israel and David was starting to create unity with the world. You could say. Uh, like I said, with an enemy, making peace with an enemy. Yes, you're going to make peace, but not to have a pact with the enemy. And especially with the Ammonites, they were told not to seek peace, nor should they have prosperity, uh, their prosperity all your days. So David was not doing what the Lord wanted him to do. And God was stepping in to say, God's will be done. Uh, sometimes God does different things to allow us to see that he and his plan has to go forward, not, not our plan. Um, you know, it's not unusual for uh, even us as Christians to do the same thing. James 4, verses 4 and 5, it says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whosoever wishes to be a friend of the world shall make himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to this no purpose? He is jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. We have a jealous God. And, uh, you know, he wants not just part of us. He wants all of us. And he wanted the same thing with Israel. Israel was separated unto the Lord from all nations. And David was kind of not letting that separation stay. He was letting that... Uh, to meld into other nations uh, and uh, they were not to do that uh, God is going to be faithful to his plan God's going to be faithful to his word and God's going to be faithful uh, to what he wants done uh, we need to see it and David needed, needed to see it uh, so God stepped in and like I said why was he embarrassed why did why did God allow this to happen so that God's word will stay true and God's purposes will stay true. Um, regardless of our plans, we need to see that God needs to needs to rule. He needs to be God. Um, what David was doing by creating a pact, was he putting all his trust in the Lord? No, he's putting his trust into a pact within, within the enemy, within, within another country. You know, confidence in man, confidence in the creature instead of confidence in the Lord. And God rebukes that. And that's what he did there. He foiled the, the carnal hopes that David had had, the, the plans that he had had. Um, God's drawn a line in the sand. And he told them what, his people of Israel, what to do and what not to do. And he has done the same thing with us, the church. You know, how we are conduct ourselves, not to be love, not to love the world, nor the things of the world. Um, God will rebuke. God will work when we disregard the line that he's drawn in the sand. He's set his standards out. He told us what he wants us to do. He's dwelt the Holy Spirit in us, and he's zealous of what he has put inside us. He's zealous of the Holy Spirit. He wants the Holy Spirit to prosper in us, to grow us, and to prosper and to promote his design, not our design. David had his own design of how he wanted his kingdom to run. And God says, no, that's not the way we're going to do it. Uh, Israel needed not be friends with the Ammonites. And God was going to let him see that. And God was going to step in and make it happen. You know, when we look at that, we can see like in Romans 8, 28. To know that all things work together for good to those that love God. And those are called according to his purpose. And David's going to need to see that as well. And David will see that. You know, it's according to what God has designed and God's word and God's will. And, and it's how he's going to work. And that's what the, that's what the, we need to see. And that's what David needed to see. And that's why God allowed this to happen so that God can direct Israel to be the nation he needs them to be. We all have an idea of what we want our Christian life to be, but God has the one he designs 
the Christian life. He designs how he wants us to be. He designs us to, to be in the image of his son, not in the image of the world. We look for the way of least resistance is what, what David was doing. And God says, no, I need you to look for the way of confidence and trust in me. And that's what David didn't do. And that's what David was going to learn to do. Verses uh, 6 to 14 in chapter 10. And out of the sons of Ammon saw they had to become odious to David, the sons of Ammon sent and hired the uh, Aramites, Arameans uh, from uh, Bethrohab, the Arameans from Jobab, Jobab, Jodah, <laughs> Zoba, I'm sorry, uh, 20,000 foot soldiers, and the king of Nabak, Na uh, Makkah, uh, with a thousand men, and the men of Nob was was 12,000 men. And when David heard it, he sent Joab and all the army and the mighty men. And the sons of Ammon came and drew up high on the, the battle array in the entrance of the city. And the Ammonites of Zobah and uh, Rahab and the men of Nob uh, and Maka uh, made themselves in the field. So when uh, jo Joab saw the battle was set against him in front of him and in the rear he selected all the choice men of Israel and arrayed them against the Amor Amorites and when he uh, and the remainder of people he placed in the hands of uh, Abishah his brother and arrayed them against the Ammonites the sons of Ammon and said the Arameans are too mighty for me then you will help me if the sons of Ammon are too strong for you then I will come and help you in verse 12, he says, be strong and let us show ourselves courageous for the sake of, of our people, for the cities of our God. And may, the, and may the Lord do what is right in his sight. So Joab and the people that were with him drew near unto the battle against the Amorans and they, and they fled before him. When the sons of Ammon saw that... The, Arameans fled, they also fled before Abishal and returned into the city. And uh, Joab returned from the fighting against the sons of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. Um, one thing we'll look at there is when uh, the king had done uh, and humiliated the Israelites, uh, <coughs> he realized that in effect he created a declaration of war against Israel. And what he decided to do was he wasn't ready for a war with Israel. Um, he done all the activity to create a war, but he wasn't ready to fight a war. So he decided he was going to have to uh, create an army. Uh, what, he's, what you see he's done is what a lot of times what we do uh, in our lives. When we've made a wrong decision, we've done something, uh, inst we stick to our own guns. Instead of admitting that we were wrong or admitting, which is the way of the world. And a lot of times we let that way seep into our relationship with others, with Christians and with the world as well, that we stay stuck in our way, stuck in our, you know, in failure to admit a fault, failure to uh, seek peace, failure to uh, say, I, I, I made a mistake. Like I said, he is set in his ways. We're too proud. Uh, that's where he was. That's the world system is where we're too proud to, to admit, uh, admit, admit a mistake. And that's where the king of King Haman was. Uh, uh, and so he just basically prepared for a war that he wasn't ready to fight, but he made all the actions to create a war. So he basically hired <coughs> 33 uh, mercenaries, uh, three sets of uh, parts of the kingdom of Amoran, uh, from, uh, and uh, which is uh, basically the northern part of Galilee, uh, the upper east part of Galilee, um, and uh, they went to do battle against uh, Joab and uh, uh, Abishah. Uh, you know, like I say, the king, he knew of the strength of David, uh, and he knew of the general Joab, and uh, instead of saying, I, I've made a mistake, uh, he sticks to his guns and, and goes to the war. 
And like I said, a lot of times we need to see what the world does and not copy that into our lives, not copy into what we do in, in our dealing with others. Um, so when he got his 33,000 mercenaries, he divided the armies and basically they went and were trying to create a pincher on Israel. They sent an army to the north, they sent an army to the south, and Israel was in the middle. Uh, Joab sees this and splits the army up. Um, and, you know, God is gracious and Lord's grace is gives them victory. And basically uh, they see what's there and they run. Um, God uh, works uh, mightily for Israel and gets Israel to finally do what God had wanted them to do. Not make a pact, not make treaties with the Amorites. Um What's so cool about, uh, you know, uh, verse 12, it says, Be strong and let us show ourselves courageous for the sake of our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is right in his sight. What you see is there is with Joab, you know, we always pick at Joab, but you see there with Joab, he has a, a balance of life between action and faith. You know, the action to let's be brave, the action, you know, the words uh, to let's use our minds. Let's you let's be smart. Let's do what we need to do. Let's be diligent with what we have and be confident that God's going to give victory, that God is going to that's God's going to work, that God's will will be done. Uh, what a great balance he has. We don't more very often look at Joab and say there's a, that's, a, that's a, 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 an attitude we need to have. But here we did, definitely is an attitude we need to have. We need to have an attitude of preparedness. You know, God doesn't move idle hands. He wants us moving. He wants us working. He wants us moving towards him so he can direct us. He isn't going to kick us and move us up. He wants to direct. He wants to guide and direct us. And we have to be doing our part of being brave. Let's fight bravely. Let's fight wisely. Let's use our brain. Let's use what God has given us to continue the, and let him direct and win and let God work. Um, the last part of the chapter 15 through 19 and the Amorites saw when they were defeated by Israel, they gathered themselves together. And Hadazar uh, sent and brought out the Amorites who were beyond the river and, um, and made them come to, Hel to Helen. And Sobach, the commander of the armies of uh, Hadazar, led them. And when it was told to David that they gathered all of Israel together and, and crossed the Jordan and went to Helam, and the Amorites uh, arrayed against him, but and David met him and fought against him. Uh, but the Amorites uh, fled before Israel, and David killed 700 charioteers of the Ammonites, uh, 40,000 horsemen, and he struck down Sobach, the commander of their army, and he died there. And all the kings and the servants of Hadazar uh, heard they were defeated by Israel. They made peace with Israel and served them. So the Amorites feared and kept. Uh, and were uh, Amorites feared to help the sons of Ammon anymore. Uh, the Ammonites, uh, Ammon, they learned a lesson. They they stopped. They 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 went away. But the Amorites, they did not. They were uh, going to make up for the disaster that had it, that, that happened at Midabah. Um, he recalls the, the army that's on the other side of the Euphrates River. And they decide to go against Israel, and David comes, and goes up, and brings victory for Israel. Um, you know, he kills seven hundred charioteers, forty thousand men, forty and such, and, and takes care of his soldier. Uh, this is the second time that Hadazar has taken it on against David, and twice he's lost. He he taken him on in uh, chapter eight of Second uh, Samuel. And he was made to pay a tribute to David, and now he uh, he loses again in seconds in, ch in chapter eight. Uh, he's that's when Israel was able to gain as far as the Euphrates rivers, which the land that, that God had promised him. Able, David was able to to su successfully get that. Um, 
but you see we're uh, we see God working uh, we see uh, there's, there's dangers there and that David didn't see David didn't see that you know making friends with people that you're not supposed to be friends with is not what God wants uh, we often look for the easy way out that's what David was doing he was looking for the easy way out with the Ammonites and God says that's not what you need to be doing you need to adhere to what my word says. We need to be true to the gospel. We need to be true to, to the witness that's in us. We need to be true to, to the Holy Spirit that's guiding us and lives inside us. Um, David wasn't doing that. David made his plans and we see where God works and rejects the plans. And he basically uses what he has there to get God's will to be done. Uh, you know, we look at, like I said, again, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good to those who love God, those who call purposes. You know, God is faithful. You know, he is working to transform us. He doesn't want us to be conformed with the world. And that's the same thing he wanted for Israel. Israel was supposed to be a nation separated unto the, unto the Lord so that all nations knew that God was in Israel. That was their purpose. They were supposed to be a light, of, light to the nations. And when we conform to the world, which is what David was doing by making trees and pacts with people you shouldn't have been making it with, God steps in and God changed and God worked. You know, what is great to see is that God is faithful to his word. You know, um, you know he didn't allow David to be conformed to the world system of making pacts, pacts and treaties. Uh, you know, it's uh, he. It's so much easier to create a false peace than to have peace of the Lord, and uh, David was going to accept that false peace, uh, but God was not going to let him, let that happen. Um, <coughs> Israel was not to live like other nations, and nor, nor are we as Christians. We're not to live like the rest of the world. We're not to live according to the world's standards. Uh, and God stepped in. You know, the great thing is that God is faithful to his word. God is faithful to his promise. And God is faithful to execute his will. Uh, even though David's plan seemed like a good plan as far as the world is, is concerned. But according to the Lord, that's not what he was going to do. You know, when you see all things work together for good, a lot of times we um, we start chafing and having an attitude against the Lord when things don't go the way we want them to go or things don't happen the way we the way we want them to happen. Instead, we need to be thankful that God is faithful to His Word, faithful to us, regardless of what plans we have. Uh, we just need to see that we need to be faithful to let his plans be be first. Don't try to do the easy way or the shortcut out. Do it according to what God's will is, what God's word is, not contrary to God's word. And that's what David was doing. He was going to do something that was contrary to the word. And God stepped in and said, not so fast. I need you to be faithful to me. I need you to be have your confidence in me. And when we start making plans in our Christian lives to be comfortable as opposed to being confident in the Lord, don't be surprised that God is going to step in. Don't be surprised when God rebukes. Don't be surprised because God is still faithful. Uh, thank you for joining and we get to see you next week. Have a good night.